promote the exchange of innovative and scientific information between researchers, developers, engineers, students, and practitioners. It will provide opportunities for academicians to receive informal, in-depth feedback through discussions and to enable them to establish contact with professionals in various countries and institutions, and also to encourage regional and international communication and collaboration. Another goal is to promote the transformation of fundamental research into institutional and industrialized research and to convert applied exploration into real-time application. The accepted papers of IEEE N 2021 will be published in Springer's lecture notes in networks and systems and extended selected papers will be published in the special issues of reputed ISI index journals. Taking this event further, I'm overwhelmed to now welcome Dr. Ashish Khanna, convener of IEEE N 2021 to brief us about the conference. Yeah, sorry, there was uh, some network issue. Uh, thank you, Kashika, uh, for inviting me. So uh, good morning to uh, everyone uh, over here. I, Dr. Ashish Khanna, welcomes all you all to the International Conference on Computing and Communication Networks, that is IEEE in 2021. I warmly welcome our Honorable General Chair, Professor Omer Rana from Cardiff University, UK, and our Honorary Chair, Dr. John G. Hall, EIC Expert Systems from the Open University, UK. Further, I happily uh, welcome our uh, conference chair, Dr. Darren Densi and Dr. Ali Kashif Bashir from Manchester Met Metropolitan U University, UK. I also welcome our academic partners, Professor Paul Kowalski from Yen Wyszkowski University and Professor Joanna from Warsaw University of Life Sciences, Poland. I welcome all the scholars who have joined us today. This conference is organized jointly by Manchester Metropolitan University UK and the Universal Innovator res uh, respectively. Whereas our academic partners are uh, Yen uh, Wyszkowski University and Warsaw University of Life Sciences, both from Poland. I warmly welcome our keynote speakers, Professor Manu Malik, uh, who is EIC of Computer and Electrical Engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology USA and Professor Mohammed Imran from Glasgow University. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our honorary chairs, journal chairs, conference chair, technical program chairs, publicity chairs, publication chairs, advisory committee, and technical uh, program committee members, speakers, and delegates across the globe in this gala event. A massive round of applause for our volunteers, sponsors, organizers, and associated partners who have contributed to this great cause. I would also like to take a moment to extend my gratitude towards the media person who are also here to uh, cover the event. Some of the highlights uh, of the conference are, it is the first version of the conference. Registered papers will be sub submitted to the Springer LNS L double NS series. IEEE-CN uh, IEEE uh, 2021 received 210 papers from 52 countries from the entire globe, uh, whereas out of the received papers, 53 papers from 28 countries were accepted and the acceptance ratio is around 25%. Further, the ex extended papers will be, uh, further the extended registered papers will be given the chance to be submitted to the SCI and Scopo journals, which are available on the website of the conference. In the uh, in, in the last, my special thanks to all the authors who have uh, also submitted their valuable papers over here and are present here to attend the conference. Uh, once again, I welcome you all and greet you in the mesmerizing and memorial uh, mem organization point of the IEEE conference. Universal Innovator. Uh, have already uh, conducted the conferences like uh, IEEE-C of Ostrava and Jan, uh, Jan University at Czech Republic and Poland respectively. So uh, we were just uh, thinking to uh, organize the conference uh, based on the networks. So in the meantime, we have already worked with uh, Dr. Ali Kashif Bas 
active on certain projects so we just discuss the same the same thing with the with him he advised us uh, that uh, they can go to metropolitan university uh, and we are really thankful to the manchester metropolitan university uh, uk uh, dr darren dancy and dr ali kashif basar uh, basher sir supported us uh, a lot in the conference thank you very much uh, over to you uh, thank you so much sir for your wonderful address every success story begins with a vision The Universal Innovators is a private and autonomous body promoting research-based activities all over the world. To talk more about the joint collaboration of Universal Innovators and Manchester Metropolitan University (UK), we have with us Dr. Ali Kashif Bashir, who is the Joint Conference Chair of I Triple C N 2021. I welcome you, sir, and I request you to address the audience. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, wherever you are. So, with respect to your time, it is my pleasure to serve as a chair for for this conference, uh, along with Professor Darren Dancy. Uh, as uh, Kashika and uh, Dr. Ashish mentioned, it is a joint venture between Manchester Metropolitan University and Universal Innovators. Uh, Universal Innovator is led by Dr. Dr. Deepak and Dr. Ashish, and they have been organizing few conferences. Successfully in few parts of the world, such as in Italy, Poland, India, and probably in few other countries as well. Uh, last year, in the in the beginning of this year, they they showed interest to organize this conference at Manchester Metropolitan University. And uh, being a vibrant and continuously evolving university, we always welcome such kind of scientific and research activities. just a brief introduction of manchester metropolitan university we are sector leading in apprenticeship programs we are working with the businesses from all over the all over the uk and we are also leading to umbrella projects in 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 the northwest which is which are called greater manchester cyber foundry and greater manchester artificial uh, intelligence foundry Uh, we have in collaboration with university of lancaster university of manchester and university of salford and manchester metropolitan university is leading these projects these are both are 7 million 7 million uh, pound projects uh, our department is recently nominated i mean uh, uh, in uh, as a third uh, i mean highly cited department in the computing and mathematics all over the uk as dr ashish mentioned that uh, we have received around 210 articles from all over the world and we have chosen 53 or 52 for the presentation um for that the objective was to hold the conference physically but uh, uh, due to ongoing situation all over the world a few of our presenter they were having some difficulty in traveling uh, and then we decided to hold this this online but we have planned to continue uh, upcoming events like you know in the coming years and uh, hopefully we will have them physically and with more energy more passion and with more strength i am highly thankful to all the collaborators part- particularly from my side if i talk about m- my department our event management team who were on board in physically organizing the conference but just one month ago we decided to to take it online uh, from uh, other perspective i'm highly thankful to all the these prestigious uh, professors professor gan carlo from university della uh, cali calabria sorry if i'm not good at pronunciation some of the names are very difficult for me and uh, dr polo polo kovski from jan uh, vizes kovski university poland professor joanna from uh, warsaw university of life sciences poland Uh, from uk side i'm highly thankful to professor john hall uh, the vice chancellor of the open university uh, dr umar rana and most importantly i mean over two wonderful keynote speakers they are up in no introduction required professor mohammad ali imran is a famous name in wireless technologies in the uk and all over the world professor manu malik is editor in chief and leading this journal com- uh, computer and electrical journal successfully for several years he's also attached with, with stephen institute of technology usa at the last uh, uh, all the participants all the other organizers whom i mean uh, it is not possible to name all of them thank you for your wonderful support and uh, this conference is a is a 
productivity is a fruit of your all your efforts and uh, we continue seeking your support in the future for the for the presenters i hope you will enjoy this conference i hope that you will collaborate with each other ideally the conferences are also for the collaboration physically we meet each other we get to know each other and we know we understand that we are all from the same planet same board regardless which every country we are from we are on working on similar problems to solve the you know to, to take the to serve the humanity to serve the society so please uh, take this opportunity to learn from each other collaborate i mean if you are if you like some presentation drop uh, uh, researcher drop present drop them an email and just feel free to collaborate and thank you very much uh, all of you for being here thank you back to you Mashika. So much, sir, for throwing some light on the valuable collaboration and for your motivating address for the audience. As we know, IEEE N 2021 has been organized by the Manchester Metropolitan University, UK. We now have Professor Darren Donsey, Conference Chair of IEEE N 2021, to address the gathering and to tell us more about the university. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. And, uh, and welcome uh, to everybody, uh, a really warm welcome to, to Manchester and to Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, um, I would appreciate that due to global events, we, have, uh, we are doing this conference online, um, but um, I hope that um, the spirit of, of Manchester Metropolitan University and, and of the wider city comes through. Um, it is uh, a shame. Uh, I am uh, disappointed that we can't welcome you uh, in person uh, on into into Manchester and to Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, this is a um, a great time for um, Manchester. Uh, Manchester in the UK is now uh, the uh, fastest growing tech hub uh, in Europe and is uh, the largest tech hub in in the UK outside of of London. And there is a really exciting time to be um, to be in Greater Manchester. So um, please, if you do get the opportunity, to please do uh, come and uh, visit us and colleagues here uh, at Manchester. The uh, university is uh, investing heavily into uh, science engineering uh, at the moment. Uh, we are um, building a 130 uh, million um, UK uh, building. Uh, to home, to provide a new home to, to science engineering here. And that is going to give us uh, a, a very rich um, platform to, to further extend our, our research here in, in Manchester Metropolitan. And, uh, and then um, it provides us with a huge amount of, of growth opportunity. Um, so if you are, excuse this slightly cheeky plug, if you are looking to work uh, in, in the UK, in, in Manchester, please do contact, uh, make contact with us. We, have, we are growing the team here. Um, so it is, um, you know, I am uh, you know, really pleased that Manchester Metropolitan could be um, involved in this conference, this very prestigious series of conferences. And um, as Ali uh, was just uh, outlining, uh, it is a real honor to be in the company of so many distinguished researchers and um, the uh, the keynote speakers, but the whole of the the conference uh, has just got an amazing uh, lineup, and I think it is going to be uh, a really uh, interesting and powerful conference. I think uh, colleagues who are attending will be able to look back on this moment and say, you know, this was a, a real uh, opportunity to to that led to new collaborations, to hear around new research, and new opportunities. Um, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, this will be uh, a really successful uh, conference that has real meaning um, for everybody in both the short term and the long term. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening the audience about the university and this conference. Great things in business are never done by one person. They're done by the support of a team of people. Similarly, this conference of IEEE N 2021 has received its support from various Polish universities. I would like to call upon our academic partner, Dr. Zyslaw Polakowski from Jan Wiwakowski University, Polkowice, Poland, 
I welcome you, sir, to throw some light on the collaboration of IEEE N 2021 with Polish universities. So you're still mute. Can you see my screen and yes, can sir. you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for invitation to be part of this international conference. But uh, main partner from Polish side, this is university from Warsaw and my university, UJW University. But frankly speaking, in this moment, I work in four Polish universities. So it means all four universities where I work in this moment, I try to promote and I try to, <clears throat> um, um, uh, to, to build some, let's say, connections between those universities and some universities from abroad. Let me uh, say a few words, just uh, two sentences, three sentences about each university. So first university where I, where I, in this moment, this is University of Economics, of economy in Bydgoszcz. In this university, uh, I teach mostly in uh, English only international uh, students. This university is uh, totally international concentrated. So it is concentrated on international students. Jan Wyszykowski University, this is a university founded by our authorities, city, uh, authorities of my city, and this university prepares students for a business zone which we have. Next university, this is a government university, University of Economics and Business in Wrocław, a very good, nice university located in uh, west and south of Poland. And also, um, last one, university, the Karkonosze State the University of Applied Sciences in Yelenia Gura. All universities are very good, very nice, and they collaborate with many universities, especially from India. And we have some effects, conferences, publications, short visit, but frankly speaking, still I see that uh, there is a, some, maybe not problem, but we want to engage our students from all universities to, uh, to participate in international activities. It means some joint classes, joint publications. So our idea is that we professors are for students, not professor, uh, students are for professors. Uh, thank you, thank you very much and see you soon in India or UK. Thank you or Poland. Thank you so much, sir, for addressing the audience and enlightening them with your thoughts. Next, I would take the opportunity to introduce our academic partner, Dr. Joanna Polaskiewicz. She's a professor at Warsaw University of Life Sciences, Poland, and she's going to illuminate the audience about the Warsaw University of Life Sciences. I welcome you, ma'am, and I request you to address the gathering. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Welcome at International Conference on Computing and Communication Networks. This year, the conference is co-organized by the Management Institute from Warsaw University of Life Sciences in Poland. The university is one of the oldest and biggest in Poland. It has more than 200 years. It was established in 1816. The university offers 37 different fields of the study, we have 13 faculties in agriculture, economic, humanities, and technical science. I'm director of Management Institute, and in this unit, we are making research related with Internet of Things, information technology, knowledge management, trust, and social media. We are open for cooperation, exchange of students, exchange of staff, and international networking. I would like to take opportunity to thank you all for contributing to this conference and for inviting us to be a partner. And I wish you a meaningful presentations, discussions and collegial networking. Thank you very much. For addressing the audience and telling us about the dynamics of Warsaw University. Now, 
I would like to introduce Professor Umer Rana, General Chair of ICCN 2021 and Professor at Cardiff University, UK, to walk us through the collaboration and work opportunities in the United Kingdom. Hello, my name is Omar Rana. I'm a professor. Uh, Kashika, I think uh, uh, it's not working. Maybe if you have put yourself on mute, that's why. Uh, sir, Ikanj, sir, is sharing the screen. Okay, okay. I thought Hello, you were my sharing. name is Omar Rana. I'm a professor of computer science at Cardiff University. And it's wonderful to be part of the International Conference on Computing and Communication Networks taking place in Manchester. And I'm really grateful for the conference chair, Dr. Ali Kashif Bashir, for giving me an opportunity to be part as a general chair this year and being part of the conference. It's wonderful to see that this is a truly international conference with technical program chairs coming from Brazil, Italy, Egypt, and Kosovo, and also the conveners coming from both London, Turkey, and India. Uh, and also grateful to uh, Dr. Deepa Gupta for the invitation. To quote from a, our Baroness Randerson, who is our chancellor at Cardiff University, true scholarship is always international. So we always need to calibrate our research by looking at what other colleagues are doing around the world and also interacting with them uh, to understand, for example, how to solve large scale global challenges, especially true in the context of this conference, which focuses on emerging data communications, networks, and computational science problems. So it's wonderful to see a community of people come together. And I, I can see that you have two excellent keynotes, both from Glasgow and the US at Stevens Institute, who will be talking about various aspects associated with these areas. Just to give you a context for Cardiff, Cardiff is situated on the in the west side of the UK, and Cardiff is a capital of Wales. We have approximately 33,000 students, of which 9,500 are postgraduates. 6,500 of our staff are from 87 different countries, which are over 30% of our uh, total number of staff at Cardiff. 160,000 alumni from 180 countries, and we are ranked fifth in the UK in terms of the research excellence framework. Cardiff is also a member of the Russell Group of Universities in the UK. And you can see some pictures of this of the university, very much like Manchester Metropolitan University, which is hosting this conference. Cardiff University is also situated right in the middle of the city, and the, the campus is very much integrated into the city center. As in many institutions in, in the UK, our greatest assets remain our students. To highlight the international education strategy for the UK from 2021, uh, and, and some quotations here taken from this strategy, so coronavirus has presented many challenges in every aspects of global society, in particular education. And, and as mentioned in this report, education provision throughout the world and at all levels has been put on hold and delivery modes have had to be altered. Many feel that the effects of this will be longstanding and will have a very human impact on skills, on equality and on economic impact on productivity and income. This is a quotation taken from Sir Professor Sir Steve Smith, uh, who is the international education champion working with the Department for Education on developing this international strategy. In the UK, we have a large number of international students. So in 2019 to 2020, the UK hosted around 560,000 international students, which was an increase of about 12% since the previous year. The coronavirus pandemic has also had a significant effect in the UK and also around the world for strengthen the need for international cooperation and shown how important it is that we support the recovery and sustainable growth of international education. In Wales, the Welsh government's international strategy published in 2020 commits to working with education institutes to also increase, provide diversity for Wales and creates an environment where multiple students can learn from each other demonstrating the kind of research engagement between the UK and international partners. So 
if you look at the frequency of UK collaborative publications coming from Scopus, uh, we can see that the US has been the number one collaborating partner for, US, for the UK, particularly in the area of science and engineering. And so co-published papers with co-authors from the US dominate uh, within the period of 2010 to 2019. However, you can see a very interesting graph from 2010 to 2019, China has been growing steadily until 2019 when China is actually now the number two uh, collaborator for UK academics in terms of research publications, followed by Germany, Australia, and Italy. This graph is an interesting, interesting trends that demonstrates how research collaboration and has changed over the last few years. And you can also see this bilateral growth in terms of the core publication profiles or publications with Chinese authors over time. This is another graph that demonstrates an interesting trend in terms of the number of patents uh, that have been awarded uh, from, uh, from the year 2011 to 2019 on the bottom left-hand side and from 2005 to 2019. So you can see the growth in terms of the patents coming from China, uh, which suddenly changed in 2015. And this graph also demonstrates the areas in which these patents are being produced. So out of a database of 1,790 patents. So AI dominates in this case, uh, followed by robotics. And this is then the overall number of patents that were observed. This report particularly focuses on AI robotics and innovation in this area. This report was produced by the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University in the US. And very, very interesting trend that you can observe here is where these patents are coming from. So you can see here that in China, of the total number of patents, 4% are coming from companies and 92% originate from research or engagement at universities, followed by 4% from government-funded research institutes. And if you compare it with the US, the commercial or the companies dominate, the commercial sector dominates with 84% of the patents being originated from companies as in other developed countries like Germany, Japan, and South Korea. So this trend that we observe in China is particularly interesting. Cardiff University has a number of international partners globally. We work with five key partners. These are Xiamen and Beijing Normal in China. University of Campinas in Brazil, University of Bremen in Germany, and the University of Waikato in New Zealand. And we also have civic mission partners. Two of them are in Africa, University of Namibia and University of Zambia. And Cardiff University has a research center based in Malaysia called the Dano Girang Field Center in Sabah. The civic mission partners are primarily there to help us engage more actively on global challenge problems with local societies and demonstrate how research undertaken at Cardiff can work and engage with these local communities in both Namibia, Zambia, and Malaysia. We also have International Memorandum of Understanding for Research and Student Recruitment with a number of international partners. And this year in 2021, we actually ran a summer school virtually with many of our international partners. Just highlighting one particular uh, area or one particular civic mission partner. This is the Dano Garang Field Center. And the reason this, field, this, this particular collaboration is so relevant for this conference is because it involves monitoring rainforests and other kinds of habitats for animals in the Malaysian rainforest in Borneo. So here, sensor technologies and emerging technologies such as LoRaWAN and, and wide area networking Needs to, be, needs to operate in very hostile and harsh environments. Things like rainforests and other kinds of environmental factors can limit the data rates that you would observe from the sensors that we deploy. So over the years, Cardiff University has had a number of masters and PhD students from different countries working with the Dano Gehring Field Centers. And this has also led to collaboration with a number of other global partners in wildlife health and also in genetic and forensic laboratories and wildlife monitoring. Uh, Cardiff, uh, Cardiff also engages very actively with the Welsh government and the Welsh government has recently introduced a scheme to enable students to come to, to, to Wales called the International Learning Exchange Program. It's primarily there to support student mobility from 
a number of countries globally. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this event. I'm again very grateful to Dr. Ali Kashif Bashir and Dr. Deepak Gupta, and, and, and also wishing all of the authors and other members who've, who've come to this conference all the very best for the future. Thank you very much. Dr. Umair Rana for his message and for sharing his thoughts with us. I'm sure that all the participants got to know immensely. Next, we are honored to have with us Dr. John G. Hall, Honorary Chair of ICCN 2021 from the Open University, UK, to enlighten us about how Open University can be collaborated with other universities. I welcome you, sir, and I request you to say a few words. Thank you ever so much for that very kind introduction, Kashika. Um, my name is John Hall. Um, I'm from the Open University. Um, it's such a great honor to speak to you this morning as honorary chair, and I thank Dr. Gapter and his team for their extremely kind invitation. I thank Manchester Met, as I know it in, in the UK, but MMU, um, Cardiff, and those great Polish universities for hosting and sponsoring, and to Universal Innovators for their leadership and sponsorship of this, of this conference. I'm an academic at the UK's Open University, and I'm editor-in-chief of Wiley's Expert Systems, the Journal of Knowledge Engineering. Um, you can see the, there's a, a, a URL on the screen for the, for the journal if you uh, want to uh, submit your extended papers, and I would really welcome seeing them. Um, as I said, I'm from the Open University, which is one of the largest universities in Europe, and has become a, a template for many other open universities across the world. It's also one of the most open universities that there are. And the open university is always looking for collaborators in many, many academic areas, including and especially computing and communications, which is the wonderful area that I work in. Um, as the world begins to recover from a very difficult time, the Open University is investing heavily in collaboration across the world, both for research. Um, the Open University, if you don't know this, has over a thousand PhD students in all areas, all across the world, um, but in teaching as well. So please get in contact with me at johnhall.open.ac.uk and you can see the, the, the link on the screen to begin our collaboration. Fellow and respected academics, we're here today and tomorrow to talk about innovation. Innovation is what we do in universities. That much is clear. What is less clear is that without dissemination of our innovations, we are nothing. And that's why academics built the first, the very first social networks. And we did it not 20 years ago, we did it more than 500 years ago because academics took what was then the brand new movable print technology and made it the means by which scientific innovation could be delivered to everyone that wanted it and needed it. We didn't have to wait for computers to do our thing, but now that they're here, we're incorporating them into our social networks so that we can hold amazing events like this. Dissemination of our innovations through journal and conference publication, intermediated by the best quality improvement system that has ever been invented, and by that I mean peer review, is what keeps science and engineering ahead of the curve. So today and tomorrow, you are here to celebrate and disseminate your innovations and to listen to those of others. I implore you to do a great job over the next two days because the world's future literally depends on it. Thank you, and I'll hand back to Kashi here. Thomas, sir, for illuminating the audience with your visions and for showing us a new perspective about collaborations and innovation. Next, I take the opportunity to call upon Dr. Deepak Gupta joint convener of ICCN 2021 to deliver the vote of thanks.
thank you uh, very much uh, for inviting me uh, good morning uh, to all i deem it a great honor and uh, privilege to propose the vote of thanks uh, on behalf of the organizing committee of uh, i triple c and 2021 i extend my heartfelt gratitude to the governing management faculties staffs and students of organizing university manchester metropolitan university united kingdom the keynote speakers our panelists delegates session chairs paper presenters and participants of this conference from 28 countries first and foremost i would like to thank our general chair professor omar rana our honorary chair dr john g hole who despite of their busy schedule have found time to grace the inaugural ceremony of the international conference on computing and communication networks i would like to thank our keynote speaker professor uh, mohammad uh, imran from university of glasgow uestc united kingdom and professor manu malik from stephen institute of technology usa we are grateful to them for accepting the invitation to take part in ieccc and 2021 and share their expertise and knowledge on the topic with the participants of this conference we are grateful to our technical program chair professor gian carlo fortin for his presence and kind support in reviewing process professor zizislo uh, polkovski from jan vizikoksi university professor joena from uh, warsaw university of life sciences for giving their uh, priceless support to ieccc and 2021 and agreeing to be the academic partners i would like to give my sincere thanks to the uh, darren dancy head of department school of computing and mathematics manchester metropolitan university and dr ali kasi bashir a reader in networks and security Uh, manchester metropolitan university united kingdom for their constant support and motivation and creating an ecosystem for smoother conduction of the international conference on computing and communication networks at last i would like to thank our sponsors student volunteers reviewers special session organizers workshop organizers participants keynote speakers and publication partner for their constant support in organizing the conference virtual mode now i am happy to announce that the conference is a grand success it is an honor for me to thank all the participants to participate in ieccc and 2021 thank you so much so much deepa for expressing gratitude to all our dignitaries and our participants with this we will be moving ahead with our keynote speeches we have with us our keynote speakers who will be enlightening the audience with their expertise Our first keynote speaker for today is Professor Muhammad Imran, Dean at the University of Glasgow, UESTC, United Kingdom. Professor Muhammad Ali Imran, Fellow IET, Senior Member of IEEE, Senior Fellow HEA, is a Dean University of Glasgow, UESTC, and a Professor of Wireless Communication Systems with research interests in self-organized networks. wireless network control systems and the wireless sensor systems he heads the communications sensing and imaging research group at university of glasgow and is a director of center for educational development and innovation he is an affiliate professor at the university of oklahoma usa adjunct research professor at ajman university uae and a visiting professor at 5g innovation center university of surrey uk He's also the principal investigator for Scotland 5G Centre's urban test bed in Glasgow and an advisory board member for UK 5G. He has over 20 years of combined academic and industry experience with several leading roles in multi-million pounds funded projects. He has filed 15 patents, has authored and co-authored over 400 journals and conference publications, has authored two books. edited eight books and authored more than 30 book chapters he has successfully supervised over 40 postgraduate students at doctoral level he has been a consultant to international projects and local companies in area of self organized networks his topic for keynote is 5g to 6g what should we expect and why is it important for all of us i welcome you sir to a meeting Th th thank you very much and uh, i hope everyone can hear me and i have shared my screen everyone can see this yes it is visible as well 
thanks to Kashika as well as Dr. Ali Kashif Bashe, who actually invited me for giving this uh, keynote. So it's a great opportunity for me to share some of my thoughts about the future of digital connectivity, moving from the state of the art 5G systems to 6G systems. What I see as the future is an emerging internet of senses where communication technology will now be benefiting from advancements in sensing technology. So I would start with very brief introduction about the University of Glasgow, where I come from. Uh, it was established in 1451, it's fourth oldest English speaking university in the world. And it uh, really uh, boasts on, on having the engineering giants on whose shoulders we stand for our new innovation and development. The names include James Watt, William Thompson, William Rankin, and John Logibird, uh, inventors of several fundamental concepts in science and technology and engineering. So <clears throat> this continues and we are very privileged that uh, the first minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, chose our center as a place where she announced Scotland's 5G strategy, a strategy outlining Scotland's vision for 5G and our commitment to embracing the opportunities it will give to build towards Scotland's aspiration to establish this country as a forward-looking digital nation. And as part of this Scotland 5G strategy and Scotland 5G Centre was established, we are the founding partner of Scotland 5G Centre. And the aim of the centre is to promote the technology and then start the era of development of next generation, which is 6G. So everyone has heard about it and many people are now actually using 5G contracts from different mobile network operators. But what is 5G? Simply speaking, it's a higher speed, high performance wireless mobile communication system. So which is taking uh, from 3G, the time that it would take to download the two hour long Guardian of the Galaxy movie. It is bringing that time from 26 hours that it will take on 3G to just 3.6 seconds, it will take on 5G. But it is more than, for example, massive IoT connectivity. As uh, my colleague, uh, Professor John Hall was mentioning about Internet of Things. So this is the technology which will allow for those billions of simultaneous connections that we will require from the future of wireless connectivity. It also enables ultra reliable and ultra high uh, reliability as well as ultra low latency of communication, which enables us to use wireless technology to connect our mission critical systems, like our smart grid, like our nuclear power plants and their control and communication mechanisms. So this also, of course, as I mentioned before, increases the broadband capacity which in turn increases the speed at which data can be downloaded. So there are different use cases which sits on this triangle of these three vertices, uh, which I just mentioned. And each of these use case requires different underlying physical layer, networking layer technologies to enable them. However, is there a scope for next generation beyond 5G? There will always be some room for improvement. So if you look at this web diagram, what you can see is, we have significant room for improvement in the security, trust, identity, and privacy of wireless connectivity to form the 6G system. We can better our coverage. 5G has done a very good job in even deployment in rural and far-fledged areas, but with 6G, we want to make it a global connectivity solution. We have to further increase the involvement of intelligence either it's artificial intelligence or human intelligence in order to run, configure, optimize, and heal the wireless communication networks. And then of course, cost efficiency. And this is cost efficiency is indeed uh, an enabler to deploy this network in global south, as well as the rural areas as well, in order to improve digital connectivity and digital inclusion, I should say. So we have published a recent paper with uh, some world leading researchers, including Mahdi Benis, Marwan Dabba, and Professor K.K. Wong uh, on uh, a speculative study or outlook of 6G. What 6G will look like? What will be the key enabling features of 6G? Conceptually, one important difference between 5G and 6G will be the increase in the number of vertices or number of 
a specifically designed use cases, like I mentioned, ultra reliable, low latency communication, massive machine type connectivity use case, and enhanced mobile broadband use case for 5G. In 6G, we will have additional use cases like ultra intelligence, which will enable self-organized that coverage working and another word is which is sustainability and equitability as i mentioned the digital inclusion as well as low energy or energy efficient or net zero uh, wireless communication infrastructure so the elements which will make this happen the, at the core of this is a ubiquitous artificial intelligence or machine learning capabilities which bring everything together, which automates the system, which allows the system to meet its energy efficiency, spectral efficiency, and operational efficiency targets simultaneously. It will enable an era of ultra fast broadband, ultra high precision sensing, ultra massive connectivity, and wide coverage, including rural and urban areas as well. And this has to be done at the least cost of energy as we are aware that energy bills are quite significant for mobile network operators and any waste of energy creates a contribution to our carbon footprint. This will enable many other use cases which have already started to see some movement towards by the ushering of the era of 5G itself. So 6G will uh, provide uh, the necessary step movement or step change that will probably uh, complete our ambition and mission of deploying six generation use cases like a smart city, healthcare for, uh, with digital connectivity, smart manufacturing and factories, autonomous cars, which is already uh, a very fast moving industrial area, urban air mobility uh, for delivery of goods, plus maybe in future for human transport as well. Gigabits per second, for fast moving vehicles like bullet trains, Hyperloop, uh, and then live concert and sports event broadcasting. And finally, Internet of Things networks, where a lot of uh, mundane daily life things are now requiring connectivity to the internet. But one step which is very important, and that's what I said at the beginning as well, what we are seeing as a trend is that it's not just data that we need to transmit anymore. Increasingly, there is a need to transmit additional senses other than vision and speech. So in this communication as well, you are seeing my two dimensional video and you're listening to my audio. But in future, people are more and more demanding to have immersive experiences, immersive virtual telepresence experiences. And that requires a multi-dimensional video transmission at very high definition, plus my voice at a very high definition and quality. But additionally, in future, maybe there might be a need to transmit touch, uh, to, do, to let people do hand-skilled uh, jobs. Uh, uh, at a different, at, at a distance, actually require uh, a specialized uh, sensing and communication. So that will create an internet of senses. So as uh, I have just mentioned, uh, the two senses that we have, uh, very frequently and very successfully transmitted over last half a decade or uh, even more if we go beyond half a century probably is speech and now recently uh, the video images as well but now we are looking at how we can transmit uh, the taste smell and touch and probably the first thing to start with will be touch and just to give you an idea of the scale uh, if you want to transmit the sense of touch over your palm, this will be gigabits per second uh, transmission requirements if you want to give a good human experience. So these things require high data throughput, high reliability and low latency communication because you have to ensure your hand, eye or hand brain coordination when you're communicating these senses. How do we pave the way to 6G1? very important ingredient to do 6G development, or even it was important in 5G as well, is to do across uh, the spectrum uh, development and research for different technology readiness level. We have to come up with innovative ideas, innovative materials for sensing, innovative techniques and signal processing ideas for sensing. But at the same time, we have to develop technologies 
which are commercially ready and deployable. So that's why there is a need for very balanced approach in fundamental and applied research. And as an example for 5G, we did fundamental contribution to self-organized networking framework in terms of convergence, reliability, efficiency, energy and capacity uh, limits, as well as trade-offs. But as this, at the same time, we worked very closely with the industry to do test and trial system optimization and commercialization of those technologies. Same thing is required for 6G if you want to achieve this in the next decade or so. Our main innovation to enable sixth generation of communication, as well as uh, to contribute partly to fifth generation of communication is the concept of self-organized networking. Many people have used artificial intelligence and machine learning to solve some specific problems, either in networking or communication or in other areas or disciplines of engineering and computing. However, our main contribution is to develop a system which evolves over time by learning from its past experiences. It sits closely with network. It does not have to be reinvented and reintroduced for every new problem that is thrown at us. Rather, it is an integral part of the system and allows for automated learning and evolution over time. Our main applications at communication sense mentioning, so 3D immersive transmission of video and in future, transmission of touch and other senses as well. Connected healthcare, where we use non-wearables as well as wearable technologies, simultaneous communication and sensing techniques in order to promote these new technologies. I will go through some of these in a slight bit more detail within the time limit that I have. So what we have done is we have not only developed these technologies, but we have deployed with thanks and uh, support of the Scottish government, a live living test bed for 5G over our campus. What would be a, great, a greater example of a smart city than a smart campus, which is a cosmo, mini cosmopolitan of many people living together in the form of the city environment. So we are deploying the network and trialing some of these innovative cutting edge use cases in a real network of 5G. And of course, this will allow us to identify the limitations and constraints that will guide us for the development of the next generation, which is 6G. So some of the use cases, I wouldn't go through them on this slide, rather I have selected some of them to go through one by one in the, in the limit of the time, I will uh, be conscious of the time. There are some developed technologies at physical layer as well as networking layer, including mobile edge computing, including network function virtualization, software defined networking, and artificial intelligence and machine learning, which actually enable all these use cases uh, that we deploy end to end. So first of all, uh, the important and interesting one that we are developing is through a program grant from Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council is to use RF waves or wireless signals to not only transmit data, but also help us in sensing, especially the healthcare vitals of humans living at home while preserving their privacy. You could do these things by variables or by inserting installing cameras in their homes, which is a breach of their privacy. So how we can do that using the omnipresent Wi-Fi or 5G signals in their homes in order to measure their heartbeat and their other uh, health vitals. Another interesting use case is immersive training and wayfinding using augmented and virtual reality. So one of the demonstration that we made is for our cutting edge a uh, clean room, which is James Watt Nano Fabrication Center in Glasgow, one of the largest fabrication center in uh, Europe. Uh, how we can provide students and other learners an opportunity to access this specialized system without physically going into it. So the demonstration was where our first minister, Nicola Sturgeon again, joined us from Edinburgh in order to be virtually trans teleported or transported into the James Watt Nano Fabrication center using end to end. So, working on uh, development of a closed loop system, of course, jointly with our healthcare providers like NHS Scotland and many other uh, uh, collaborators, uh, digital health and innovation Scotland and so on, in order to develop a proactive healthcare tele, tele, tele enabled proactive healthcare mechanism in future. The main concept of proactive healthcare is that you are being monitored for your health vitals without invading your privacy 
uh, as frequently as possible in your home, in your workplace. And then AI and machine learning are doing data digging and data mining in order to identify events of interest or features of interest that can indicate development, early development of any disease or any condition, which can be treated if intervention is done at an early stage. Again, this is linked with a couple of our program grants. One of them is in healthcare, and the other one is on development of a smart hearing aid, which can, in, which can improve the living conditions of people suffering from uh, uh, the loss of their hearing over time. We have many ways of uh, doing sensing. So some of the invasive ways are already in place. So wearable devices, uh, installation of cameras, but they have environmental constraints as well as privacy concerns. So we, we are moving away from this wearable and vision-based systems to an omnipresent contactless sensing mechanism where you use uh, your wireless signals around you like Wi-Fi and 5G in order to monitor the changes, subtle changes in channel quality whenever someone moves in a wireless channel. If you can pick up those subtle changes and you can correlate them with the activity happening in the room, you can start with the macro activity. You can very clearly identify if someone is standing in the room, sitting down or lying down. But if you improve the technology with signal processing and hardware design, you can actually even monitor someone's breathing rate and, in, 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 and their lip movement, for example. And in future, it can go uh, beyond this as well if we are using beyond wireless, terahertz, or quantum technologies. So uh, our roadmap is to start with single subject activity monitoring using wireless signals, and then move to vitals monitoring. So after going from macro activity into vitals monitoring, and these two things we have achieved in the lab and in some real life settings as well. But the next thing that we have achieved in the lab, but not in real life setting is multi-subject activity monitoring. And then we want to develop it further into multi-subject vitals monitoring. So more than one person in the room and we can monitor their heartbeat and other vitals without using any variables. <clears throat> and this will be enabled with another one. wireless technology surfaces, as I will show you how it plays an important role in multi-subject wireless monitoring. At the same time, we do not want to just discard wearables and other wireless technology so long as they are not uh, against our uh, uh, principle of privacy preservation. So we are working on this multi-decision fusion techniques as well, where different technologies like radar, and uh, variables are used in addition to omnipresent wireless signals around us. And then we do feature selection and data fusion in order to improve the quality of our estimation. So this has helped us in do multi-subject monitoring. So as you can see, there is a receiver, which is a USRP based or user programmable radio based. And there is a transmitter, which is a, again, USRP based transmitter. There are four uh, subjects sitting in a room environment and we can monitor that. However, when there are multiple subjects, wireless channel variations are so subtle that you cannot uh, disaggregate the uh, health vitals of multiple subjects in that room. In order to do that, you have to individually focus your RF energy on them one by one. And in order to achieve that, we bring in intelligent reflecting or reconfigurable surfaces, uh, and we have developed a hardware at our lab. So the principle is, if your subject is somewhere in the room and your transmitter and locator and a receiver are not relocatable, you have to use an intelligent reconfigurable surface to direct the wireless energy to fall on the subject that you want to observe. And then the reflection will reach the receiver and you will have more clear uh, changes in wireless channel quality uh, correlated with the actual uh, health vital that you are monitoring. We have demonstrated in the lab, and when the intelligent reflective surface is off, the difference between sitting, standing, and walking conditions is not that significant, and there is a confusion matrix, and uh, you have a significant uh, inaccuracy in uh, monitoring the uh, condition. However, if we switch on our intelligent, intelligent reflective surface, these things are clearly distinguishable and the confusion matrix converges to an ideal scenario where random uh, forest accuracy is 
So this work has been published widely and has been peer reviewed uh, and, and, and reported in different journals. So very quickly, I will very quickly, just in five minutes, I will wrap up uh, with some more uh, interesting use cases that we are working on. Using wireless technology, we are working on a very cheap mechanism or very cost effective mechanism to monitor uh, occupancy of different spaces. Why this is important? Because in future, people will be required to be monitored for contact tracing for health purposes, as well as in offices where we are moving towards agile working space or hot desking mechanisms. It's important for people to know the occupancy levels before they come to their offices. So we have developed a very low cost RFID based system in order to do that. <coughs> we have also worked on uh, an emergency which can be deployed in response to any natural uh, or man-made disaster which will de which can deplete or de destroy the communication infrastructure on ground how we can replace that on a very short notice without any prior planning and provide a very critical and uh, high key performance indicator wireless connectivity we are working on enabling real-time robotic control from a distance, so tele-robotics. Of course, people have talked about applications of tele-robotics in the uh, context of tele-surgery and remote operations. We are developing it, even if tele-operation or uh, tele-surgery might not be possible at this stage due to ethical and other medical reasons. Uh, we, what we are trying to enable is uh, something which is lower risk, for example, uh, uh, teleoperation for remote manufacturing, teleoperation for remote diagnosis, and a very interesting use case for education sector is during pandemic, we enabled our students to be able to do lab experiments remotely from their homes by using this telerobotics concept. We have developed jointly with our partners in Telefonica, O2, and Darwin, uh, a system uh, which is called Clinic on the Wheel, so the main idea is to shorten the waiting cycles, waiting lists in hospitals in NHS. These clinics can visit care homes and other remote locations in villages to provide regular testing and other medical care at the doorstep of these people. So uh, virtual telepresence, I have already covered that. So all of these uh, achievements and all of these use cases have been widely covered in international media across the globe. And we have also published extensively not our not only our technical work which enables these use cases, but we have also demonstrated or disseminated the potential of this technology through organization of several events like IEEE, IEEE-CN conference that uh, MMU and their partners are organizing. So it's always a pleasure to participate in these kind of dissemination events. And uh, I would now conclude my presentation because I wanted to leave at least 10, 15 minutes for more interactive question and answer session. I will really appreciate if you guys have any questions that I can answer. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Thank you. So it was a very informative talk. I request the attendees to ask their questions if they have any. You can raise your hands and yourselves. Or you can type a question in the chat as well. I can quickly pick it up from there. <clears throat> All of the participants can mute themselves. Please ask questions if you have any. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Muhammad Ali Imran, for a wonderful talk. Uh, just a, a journal. I mean, uh, it's always a pleasure to to listen to you, and thank you for accepting the invitation. I was just thinking, like you know, because you are leading the wireless technologies and many projects in wireless technologies. 
how i mean on the uk wide uh, for example if we can i mean i'm sure that you are already participating in many collaborative activities but do we have any chapter like you know that from umbrella umbrella chapter from where the most of the universities can work maybe let's say under the leadership of glasgow university thank you very much uh, ali that's a wonderful question and uh, i do not want to sound like we are very scotland focused but fortunately in scotland we have definitely developed this kind of um, platform where a lot of universities are working in collaboration so both of the program grants that i showed you are very scottish university focused but i really want to expand this platform to uk wide right because uh, uh, i think uh, local collaborations are good but pandemic has opened up lot of barriers people don't have to travel to collaborate even now absolutely right so so i think we 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 have to work on a uk wide maybe it might be an idea to work on a large program grant or uh, funding mechanism yeah. via esrc or innovate uk as i mentioned absolutely. that there is a need to have a very balanced approach in doing research for 6g if we want yes. to develop a technology within 10 years we cannot afford to have blue sky research only for next 5 years right we have to do both of these things together simultaneously mm-hmm. in a balanced manner and there might be a possibility of talking to epsrc and innovate uk together to have a more innovative funding mechanism where you fund some people to generate blue sky ideas but at the same time some people to transform those ideas into practical use case demonstrations or aspect based uh, yeah i mean i was just thinking you know uh, not only scotland wide but i mean all over it could be you know um, uh, a platform okay or a community or or an umbrella that provide guidance to all the academicians yeah. um, industry okay to reach the possible potential where they can they can reach Okay. because when i'm interacting here for example in the northwest when we interact with the industry they are doing i mean what they are already doing but how to expand their businesses they are seeking over you know seeking a, a kind of a guidance technical input from from academicians or other experts so if we have any kind of you know this like you know uk wide chapter it can be it can help us to you know help the community and it it can also help us to to collaborate with So with communities across the U- outside UK as well. Yes, indeed, and it's a great idea, Ali, and because you have proposed it, so maybe you will be victim of your proposal. So maybe it will be a great <laughs> idea if you if you if you lead it uh, as a young uh, researcher, right? So uh, I would definitely love to do that, and uh, prob- but uh, there, I mean, I would definitely need uh, support and guidance from I mean uh, people like you, Dr. Umar, Dr. John, and any others. Yeah, I, that's definitely a commitment from my side. Very happy to help. And Dr. Ali, I'm in, interrupting you, uh, sir. I have a question. Uh, and th- first of all, thank you, Mohammad Imran, uh, for giving us such a valuable insight about uh, the 6G and 5G. So, uh, my just one question is that uh, means, uh, although a very general question, that what are, could be the future possible health hazards related to 6G? Means the implementation of 6G means. some kind of uh, you can put some light on it yes indeed so i think the answer is uh, very 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 simple uh, so any radiation can be harmful right so there is no radiation which is uh, 100% secure for your body even even visible light right if you expose yourself to too much sunlight unprotected that can be harmful to your skin right so the key here is what are the levels of uh, emf radiation that we are exposing ourselves through 5g and 6g and there are international standards which govern it including icnip and other standards and the current systems are operating even at 10% of the uh, recommended safe uh, levels of exposures so given that i don't think there are any significant health related concerns uh if we are operating within those limits and of course that's the responsibility of any local uh, regulator spectrum allocator and those people to make sure that wherever these systems are deployed they operate within those safe limits so it's just like saying uh, <clears throat> should we avoid going into sun just because uh, 
that causes a sunburn. I think that's not the solution. Rather, the solution is to be self-aware and protect yourself when you are exposing yourself to radiation. Yeah, right. Same thing applies to even 3G, 2G as well. There is a very general yeah. advice of not <clears throat> spending too much time on your mobile phone exposed close to your head. Use your uh, hands free whenever you can. And uh, the, uh, these are general advice without any proof that these things can cause cancer or carcinogenic or not, right? So th there are many other things which are carcinogenic proven, right? So in food and other items as well, and we haven't removed them from our supply chain yet, right? So in, in short, my uh, answer is uh, uh, technology standards are there to protect us. They should be followed and uh, people should have a personal responsibility as well to safeguard their health and well -being. Thank you very much for the answer. Uh, because a lot of myths are there, so a platform like this and uh, answer from a, a, a reputed person like you will uh, clear these myths and uh, we all can spread the awareness about that this is uh, not HRDS and everything like that. Thank you. Over to you. So I, can, uh, I can take this opportunity to, if, if uh, Ashish, one line if I can add further yeah, is I can take this opportunity refer people to one of the article I, I, I wrote for IEEE ComSoc, uh, which is specifically focuses on this topic. And if you, if you search on Google, uh, uh, bust, uh, uh, busting the myths about 5G and dangers of 5G, uh, you will find my article. Uh, it, it, it explains a lot of these things slightly on more technical level. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Over to you, Ali. Uh, thank you, Professor Imran, uh, for I mean, uh, for a wonderful talk, and I will definitely get in touch with you for what we discussed. Okay, uh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we have another wonderful speaker with us, uh, Professor Manu Malik. Uh, Professor Manu Malik, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, uh, before that, before we go to Professor uh, Manu Malik, uh, I think uh, we can go back to Kashika. Kashika, I mean, uh, can you please? Uh, uh, I mean, introduce Professor Manu Malik and invite him for the for the talk. Uh, thank you to Professor Muhammad Ali Imran for joining us today and enlightening the audience with his knowledge mm -hmm. and expertise. So our next keynote speaker is Professor Manu Malik, Editor-in-Chief, Computer and Electrical Engineering at Stevens Institute of Technology, the USA. Dr. Manu Malik is the editor-in-chief of Elsevier's International Journal of Computers and Electrical Engineering. He was a distinguished member of technical staff at Lucent Bell Labs until 2001, then joined Steven Institute of Technology as professor of computer science and telecom management, from which he retired a few years ago. Dr. Malik has held several academic positions in the USA and overseas, as well as technical leadership positions at Telcordia Technologies and Lucent Bell Labs. He's the author, co-author, or editor of seven books and has had numerous paper publications in the areas of communication networks, computer communications, and network management. An alumnus of University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Malik is a fellow life fellow, life fellow of the IEEE and an IEEE third millennium medalist for his contributions. He was editor for network management of the IEEE transactions on communications from 1989 to 92 and an IEEE Comsoc distinguished lecturer from 1999 to 2007. He founded and was the editor in chief of Springer's Journal of Network and Systems Management from 1993 to 2010. His topic for the keynote is advancements in electronics, communications and applications. I welcome you, sir, and I request you to address the gathering. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And good day, everyone, from New Jersey in the USA, where the time is now about 6.50 in the morning. It's my pleasure to be participating in this conference. And uh, I would like to thank first the Professor, we hope we did not disturb your sleep. No, uh, <laughs> no, not really. I usually wake up around seven, so I had to wake up a little bit early. <laughs> thank you, thank you for this. No problem. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I need to, do I have share? 
Yes, please, if you okay. have any slide, yeah, you can share. Yes, okay, fine. Yes, uh, let me put this up. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> Uh, let me start by thanking the conference organizers and in particular, Dr. Deepak Gupta for inviting me. Uh, a word about this uh, journal, Computers and Electrical Engineering. It's a 50 year old journal published by Elsevier Publishing and indexed in many uh, major indexing services. We publish papers on many timely and state-of-the-art topics. And we have uh, special sections actually often. Right now we have special sections on topics like information security, artificial intelligence, applications, uh, cloud, fog computing, bioengineering, robotics, smart grids, and IoT related topics. In fact, uh, Dr. Gupta is a guest editor of two of our special sections. We receive more than 3,000 papers per year with an acceptance rate of about 20%. So with that uh, advertisement, sorry about that. Uh, let, me, uh, let me start. Uh, you see my slide? Oh, I have to share. Just a sec, just a sec. Share. Sorry, I have to share here. Okay, is it visible? Yes, it is. Okay, good. All right. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, in the limited time that I have, I will touch on advances in electronics, communications, and applications. In the area of communications, I will focus only on wireless and the internet. And in application, I'll talk about uh, uh, semantic web, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and the intelligent transportation system. So uh, let us start with advances in electronics. That's slide number three, the next one. Okay, we cannot talk about advances in electronics without referring to Gordon Moore's uh, prediction in 1965 that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit will double every two years. Moore's prediction has been a driving force for the semiconductor industry to guide long-term planning and set targets for research and development. And from this chart, we see that it has held pretty well. Sorry, this is a little bit, let me, let me see if I can make this very visible. Yeah, okay. Um, so many innovations by scientists and engineers have sustained Moore's law since the beginning of the IC era. Um, back in 1965, only 50 transistors could be integrated into an IC. The transistor count has grown now by more than seven orders of magnitude since then. And this is due to key innovations in semiconductor device fabrication technology, as well as interconnect techniques. IBM recently announced that using two nanometer technology, they can put 50 billion transistors on a chip the size of a fingernail. Now, engineering of alternative materials with novel structures have also led to innovative designs and performance improvement in uh, circuits and macro systems. So, 
so about advances in communications. Now, uh, and here I'm, I'm going to focus only on wireless communication and the internet, as I mentioned. The concept of mobile communication uh, or cellular radio system uh, was developed at Bell Labs. Uh, at the time, it was Bell Labs. Now it's called uh, uh, Lucent Bell Labs or Nokia Lucent. Uh, it has gone through a lot of variations. So Bell Labs was the R&D arm of AT&T in 1970. That's when this uh, concept was developed. An area to be supplied uh, with radio service is divided into hexagonal cells. That's why we call it cellular telephony, where each cell is assigned a frequency. This arrangement allows frequency reuse in, in, in non-adjacent cells. Uh, that's to prevent co-channel interference. So uh, about the channel uh, allocation techniques, uh, actually this concept was implemented in 1974, but commercial service was delayed until the, because of the breakup of the bill system in 1979. And the first commercial cellular network, what we call it 1G, was launched uh, in 1979. The so-called wireless revolution began in the early 1990s, leading to the transition from analog to digital networks. And uh, the channel allocation technique advanced from uh, FDMA, frequency division multiple access, to TDMA and then to CDMA, code division multiple access. The first commercial digital cellular network, that was called 2G, second generation, was launched in 1991. Advancement continued with the next generation of mobile communication systems like 3G, 4G. Uh, 4G is also called LTE, long-term evolution. The next generation of mobile communication, uh, that is 5G, offers improved performance in terms of network capacity, quality of service, and network availability. 5G wireless uses much higher frequencies than 4G, uh, and uh, it also uses better antenna technology. It uses actually AI techniques uh, to make more efficient use of the spectrum and offers much more, uh, a much, I should say, lower latency than 4G. So uh, over the past few years, wireless data transmission has grown by about 50% per year. This is due mostly to people uh, streaming videos, scrolling through social media, uh, actually, they say that 50% of the internet traffic now is due to YouTube and Netflix. Now, to meet this demand, spectrum must be allocated as in as efficient as possible. Uh, and uh, in the area of uh, dynamic spectrum management, DARPA, that is Defense Advanced Research Project Agency of the U.S. Research and uh, Development Agency of the U.S. Department of Defense. DARPA has initiated a competitive project called Spectrum Collaboration Challenge, or SC Squared. This is about the use of AI in, in uh, spectrum allocation, and DARPA has allocated four million dollar prize for the winner. So uh, there you are. You can, you can participate in that challenge and possibly win that prize. Um, in the current design, uh, uh, each node uses a star architecture. 
I mean, the, the architecture is the star architecture as a centrally located device, like a router or a cell tower, communicates with all the mobile devices around. But in a mesh network, which I have to bring this up a little bit, in a mesh network, right? Uh, a node can communicate with one another as well as uh, end user devices, uh, thus improving the ubiquity of wireless communication. So it goes in, in both directions, basically. Now about the evolution of the internet. Internet was, uh, was uh, introduced in the 1980s as an outgrowth of, uh, of ARPANET project, which again was another project by DARPA. The World Wide Web provided easy access to uh, internet via web browsers. We now rely on the internet daily for many services like uh, shopping, banking, manufacturing, healthcare, transportation, as well as entertainment. And it can be used independent of location due to its openness and distributed nature. Now, wireless sensor networks or ad hoc networks came about in the 1990s. They refer to a group of uh, dispersed sensors for monitoring and recording physical conditions like temperature, sound, blood level, pollution levels, and sending that collected data to a uh, central location. The next wave of connectivity was the Internet of Things. That is a system of uh, interrelated computers with a unique identifying identifier, as well as the ability to transfer data over the internet. IoT is the most disruptive event since the introduction of the internet in the 1980s. Estimates are that about 50 billion things will be connected to the IoT within the next few years. These things can be mechanical machines, digital devices, objects, animals, people, and so on. IoT devices may be as trivial as uh, RFID tags on clothing or toys uh, uh, using protocols like uh, Bluetooth or uh, Zigbee, or could be as complex as uh, industrial machines and robots. Now about the Typical applications of IoT, we have smart homes, for example, you can ask Amazon's Alexa remotely, uh, to remotely lock or unlock doors, turn on lights, start the air conditioning system. Smart cities refers to using IoT to improve quality of life in cities, like in smart transportation which enables intervehicular communication, smart traffic control, smart parking, electronic toll collection, and road assistance. Okay, sorry. Uh, smart industry. For example, companies use IoT combined with artificial intelligence to better understand their customers and improve uh, consumer experience. In the entertainment industry, uh, there is a rapid transition from scheduled programs to audio and video on demand and live streaming, providing uh, consumers with more control over what and when they want to listen or watch. In the healthcare industry, IoT is used for sharing information between patients, doctors, hospitals, and pharmacies uh, also used in health monitoring, like monitoring vital signs of patients remotely and in real time. There are so-called wearables, like uh, smart shirts, 
smart shirts can measure heart rate and respiration levels, for example, and send the data over Bluetooth uh, to a smartphone. Nike has smart shoes with sensors also. So uh, there are now special IoT. Despite the enthusiasm about IoT, there are barriers to its universal adoption. So currently we have some uh, small scale or island implementations of IoT. Uh, for example, like uh, Internet of Medical Things. Uh, you can soon measure your blood sugar using an app on your Apple Watch and send it to your doctor. Industrial Internet of Things refers to high integration of uh, uh, computers, networks, and physical objects for the industry, for example, on a factory floor. Internet of Energy, uh, for example, metering, monitoring, protection, and control of power systems to shift toward green energy. There's also Internet of People. This is to represent people as cyber entities, considering the interaction between people and devices and providing services in a smart environment, like, uh, for example, finding directions. Finally, Internet of Vehicles this is to enable vehicles to communicate with other vehicles, people, and roadside units over the Internet. So let's talk about IoT enablers. This is, uh, oh, I'm using this device. It's a little bit jumpy. Okay. So let's talk about IoT enable. IoT devices are expected to generate up to 130 exabytes of data per month exabyte being 10 to the power 18. So we need powerful data analytic tools and algorithms to process this data. So that's one enabler of IoT. The other IPv4 with 32 bit address provides only about 4 billion addresses. But for uh, IoT, we need a lot more addresses. So IPv6, the 128 bit address can provide hundreds of billions of addresses, which is uh, should be sufficient for IoT. Uh, that's another enabler. I already talked about 5G. There are now limited implementations of 5G by some companies like AT&T and Verizon in the US. Verizon used it during the February 2020 Super Bowl in the US and South Korea showcased it during the 2018 Summer Olympics. So T-Mobile in the US uh, claims that uh, it's offering 5G all over the US this year. Uh, 5G support is now built into many smartphones. So uh, one of the enablers of IoT is security and privacy and that is a primary inhibitor right now of wide, widespread delivery of uh, consumer adoption of IoT. So uh, about satellite internet. So far, limited internet devices have been available in the less developed uh, world via geosynchronous satellites. Uh, they have limited bandwidth, high latency, and relatively high cost. So uh, low Earth or low Earth orbit or LEO satellites constellations provide coverage uh, with a relatively low cost, uh, as a relatively low cost those uh, uh, hard to reach areas. 
There are several LEO satellite internet constellation projects in the 1990s, including Celestin with 63 satellites, uh, Telexis with 840 satellites, and Iridium uh, uh, with 66 satellites, providing coverage over the entire Earth. However, most of these systems became bankrupt due to high costs and low demand at that time. Now in the past decade, interest in satellite internet constellations has reemerged due to dropping cost of uh, launching satellites to space and increased demand for broadband internet. So now internet satellite constellation are uh, planned by private companies like SpaceX. Uh, the project is called Starlink. OneWeb, Amazon, which has a project Kuiper, Boeing, uh, as well as uh, Russia and China, they have projects on uh, satellite. The three largest European satellite operators are SES, uh, uh, Utelsat and Ispasat. They have satellites both in Geo and, and Leo, both geostationary and uh, and, and Mio and, and medium Earth orbits. Actually, all right. Now uh, let me address a little bit application software. In the area of application software, there have been advances in semantic web, which is an extension of the web World Wide web in which data is machine readable and can be processed by machines. It provides a common uh, framework that allows data to be shared across applications and systems. Blockchain, uh, was invented in 2008 to serve the, uh, the public transaction ledger of the cryptocurrency uh, Bitcoin. It's a growing, uh, uh, the, actually the blockchain is a growing list of records or blocks that are linked together using cryptography, uh, hashing techniques and cryptography. Each block contains a cryptographic hash of the previous block and a timestamp and contains information about the blocks before it. They form a chain, uh, thus the name blockchain. Uh, blockchain design has inspired other applications beyond the cryptocurrencies and uh, there are private blockchains that are implemented, for example, in the supply chain, as well as financial transactions. Now about the artificial intelligence and its application, uh, uh, one area is computer vision. The increasing computational power of computers uh, have uh, significantly possibility of this in computer vision. Another area is intrusion detection. Traditional intrusion detection techniques are based on two techniques, uh, misuse detection and anomaly detection. Misuse detection uses a rule-based approach to detect known intrusion methods. Anomaly detection, however, works based on defining and formulating expected normal behavior. Now, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques can be used to detect anomaly, anomalous behavior. And uh, these techniques can enhance the scale, speed, and accuracy of security solutions in uh, detecting zero-day attacks. Now, zero-day attacks are attacks that hadn't seen before, hadn't been seen before, and there is no uh, mitigation for them yet. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence in robotics also is, is used. Uh, uh, it merges several fields, including signal processing, physics, information theory, 
mathematics, biology, and mechanical systems. Smart robots will perform uh, uh, and, uh, and understand a semantic meaning semantic meaning of uh, commands uh, and the environment. They do this by intelligence sensing, automatic planning, multi-agent communication, and anticipating the outcome of, our, of uh, actions. In the intelligent transportation system, uh, uh, provide, we provide innovative services relating to different modes of transport. Uh, this includes technologies of autonomous cars and unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, commonly known as drones. Drones are originally developed for military missions as well uh, and, uh, and as costs came down, their use expanded to non-military applications as well like in aerial photography, production delivery, uh, I mean, product delivery, uh, agriculture, policing and surveillance, as well as infrastructure inspections. Several companies, uh, including uh, Joby Aviation and Archer Aviation are developing flying taxis uh, or called passenger drones. And uh, uh, Joby Aviation, actually, is California-based aerospace company, is developing an electronic vertical takeoff and landing aircraft using very light jets. They plan to operate them in 2004. Uber has a uh, has tested short flights using VTOL or, or vertical takeoff and landing aircraft in the past year. So uh, I'm going to actually, this wasn't part of the, the talk, but I'm going to conclude by green technologies uh, be, because they are so important. And they were recently a meeting in Glasgow to talk about this. Uh, and hopefully there is some progress in there. The 2015 Paris Agreement and some emission reduction that had set some emission reduction goals. Uh, but many countries are not only missing these goals, they are, they are actually net contributors to additional CO2. The rich countries pledge $100 billion to poor countries to help them deal with the effects of climate change. But that hasn't quite happen. The recent meeting in Glasgow hopefully will result in more active implementation of green technologies. To reverse climate change, the uh, global temperature must not rise more than one and a half degrees centigrade. And the atmosphere's CO2 must be limited to 350 ppm or part per million uh, the U.S. says, NASA says that in 2021, it is now about 417 ppm. So we need to bring, bring it down. In 2020, more than 30 million people were displaced due to effects of climate change, like rising water levels and volatile weather. There are now about 1 billion climate-related refugees around the world. Now, also I should mention that 2020 uh, was Earth's second hottest year beyond and behind 2016. Uh, coal is still used to produce about 35% of energy in the world uh, where uh, nuclear is about 10%, solar PV or photovoltaic is about 3%. And the use of coal increased actually 4.5% in the past year. So these are uh, disturbing statistics. 
If nothing is done, the air temperature is estimated to rise by three degrees centigrade by the year 2100. So there are some methods and uh, there are some efforts to, uh, to mitigate this. Uh, for example, CO2 capture, carbon uh, sequestration, where carbon is captured from the atmosphere and used for industrial purposes and se also sequestered under the ground. Deflecting some solar sunlight to reduce heating of heating the atmosphere is another technique. For example, using white paint uh, on the roofs of the houses to reflect the sunlight, as well as increasing the use of green energy like photovoltaics uh, energy and uh, nuclear energy. But government policies, the most important thing, government policies are needed to encourage implementation of these methods. And uh, many major companies are planning to uh, be carbon neutral within the next 10 years. So in addition to, comp uh, to government companies are being active in this area. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, uh, leave about, uh, about that five, eight minutes for questions if there are any. So for such an instructive and explanatory talk, I request the attendees to ask their questions. Please unmute yourselves and you can even use the chat box. Well, we covered a lot of topics. Hopefully there are some questions in some areas. <laughs> yeah. Thank you uh, so much, Professor uh, uh, Manu Malik, for uh, accepting our invitation and joining us um, here. Uh, you are uh, there is very early uh, in the morning at your end, so uh, yes, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, and uh, if uh, anybody is having any question, we will directly uh, ask them to mail you. Sure, certainly. Thank you very much again for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today and enlightening the audience with your knowledge and expertise. With this, we have arrived at the conclusion of the opening ceremony. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to all the dignitaries and guests of honors for joining us today. I would also like to thank all the researchers, academicians, and students for their presence. Now. I would request all the participants to move to the respective rooms for the presentations. All the best to everyone. All the participants are automatically switched to their rooms. Uh, so if uh, you get an invitation for joining the room, you can just click the join to join that particular session. We are creating uh, rooms and you will soon get the invitation to join that room. All the participants are requested to uh, rename uh, their profile name as session name and paper ID so that we can easily identify uh, which session you are from and we will directly move you to your session. The complete process will take approximately five minutes. So within five minutes, all the participants will direct it to their rooms. So please uh, wait for five minutes.
Ekansh, in case you have, if you have any instructions, you can give. As uh, you get a message on chat, all the authors are requested to rename themselves at your session number and paper ID. So that we can easily able to identify your session and you will be automatically switched to particular session. Ekansh kindly move the authors to their respective sessions like S2121 we can see. Uh, all the uh, all the participants who are left here, uh, they uh, can found a breakout room option uh, in their Zoom panel. They can directly join, click on that breakout room and you can join your session. And all the remaining uh, who have not renamed their uh, profile name is session number. So please, I request you to add a session number after their name so that it is easy to us to identify your session. Uh, 
uh, respective audience who have joined uh, the invitation to uh, listen to the talks the keynotes have are over uh, so uh, if they want they can leave the this thing so but authors will not leave the room they will join the breakout rooms uh, because this was an open in invitation for the keynotes and the opening ceremony so the opening ceremony and the keynotes are over now the paper presentation will go on in various respective sessions and the authors have the information regarding that so in case if any author is there uh, so i request uh, them to just rename their uh, name according to the paper id and the session number so that they can be allocated to their respective rooms in addition to uh, that if any session chair uh, is left here so we are not able to identify with your name i think you have log in with some other name so if there is anyone who is session chair then they can also let us know by unmuting them ekanch can you hear me yes sir ekanch kindly move s2 121 to s2 so they have been uh, allotted their respective sessions they have to click uh, on the breakout room option down in the zoom meeting okay like, yeah so you cannot do that from your end they have to no, do sir. it yourself okay yeah so s2 uh, 121 s2 26 s3 124 you are requested to move to your respective room similarly ws 0025 dr canon they you can uh, find a option in your zoom panel to go to the breakout room also with like whoever is facing some issue while renaming themselves they can also put their session number in the chat box or unmute themselves hello abram how are you if you can hear me abram seltek how are you S two one two one S two twenty six. There is an option at the bottom on your screen. You can able to move into your room. We have to just click on that. Uh, sorry, uh, how can I go to another room? Uh, your session is, sir. Uh, section four. Session four. Uh, Ekanch. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ekanch. Yes, sir. I have moved him. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Deepak sir, you are on mute. Ekansh, we uh, now we have uh, Dr. Thomas Martin. Uh, he is a session chair in session number three. Welcome, uh, Professor M. Evrim. How are you? Uh, Ekansh, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Rupak uh, is here. So uh, he is a uh, she is a session chair in session three, I think. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Rupa, can you unmute? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. Uh, welcome uh, to IEEE ZN. Uh, Ekansh, he is a session chair in session three. So we are re rewriting to uh, rewriting you to session number three. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. 